Welcome to S4 Stage 2, Technical Deep Dives. Here we go. Stephen Hilt is a senior threat researcher, and Jonathan Anderson is the manager of advanced security research at Trend Micro. Please welcome Stephen and Jonathan to Stage 2. How's it going, everyone? Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, software-defined radio research that we have been working on here at Trend Micro. Um, why did we start doing uh, Trend Micro traditionally as an AV company, so why are we doing um, software-defined radio research? It started back actually before this, one of my coworkers, uh, Marco and Kyle Wilhoy and a couple others uh, started doing research with AIS. I'm one of the first people to look into that and then two years ago, three years ago now, I released the series of looking at pagers and how uh, communications are insecure and you know, we could sniff them and, and figure out what people were trying to talk about. Um, so we were tasked again to come up with a new SDR research in which uh, we came up with a few ideas, uh, ran them by a bunch of people and decided that what we were going to look at was something that you see every day. Um, Jonathan and I were recently in Tokyo for Trend Micro CTF and this is a picture from the Rainbow Bridge uh, looking towards Tokyo. And what we saw here looks like an average city. But when you start looking in closer, you start seeing lots of things. Lots of cranes, lots of things like that. So when we originally pitched this idea, uh, we looked at things that we were going to look at. And cranes came up um, because we realized a lot of these systems are wireless. So it was a prime target, target for, of course, the software-defined radio research. <laughs> Um, so we went to a couple sites to see how all these things worked, and we quickly found, you know, this is one from a coworker of ours who went to an industrial site where they were uh, a, manuf or a construction site, and this was a construction crane. And what we saw here was, of course, it's radio. Um, so this is one type that you see uh, is it's a strap and you hold it. The other type is. Uh, this kind of system here. Um, it's more of a pendant, you wear it around your neck. Um, so then, once we started looking at these and realizing they were wireless, we asked ourselves three questions. Um, those questions were, uh, where are they used, how do they work, and what are the risks? So we're going to go real quick through where are they used. Um, does anyone here work in a place that has cranes? couple of us, okay. Um, are they wireless cranes or do you not know? Uh, I asked one of my uh, mechanic friends if I could look at his and he brought me over and there was no way to hack it. It was still chain driven so that didn't work out very well. <laughs> so that, that in case is an industrial hoist. Um, there's mobile hoist. Uh, concrete pumps use these systems. Agricultural uses these systems, logistics, uh, harbors, and stuff like that use um, wireless controllers. Here they use them on a very forefront, and because the crane operators get really bad vertigo, uh, they've actually removed uh, the people in a lot of uh, places, and they move them to a control center, and they aren't physically sitting there moving with the crane. Uh, forestry uses them. Uh, drilling operations, industrial automation, uh, mining. Pretty much what we're saying is everything, everywhere uses these. I used to work for a utility. I know utilities use these. Um, nuclear uh, industry uses them uh, as to lift the material out, to lift the reactor lids. Just any, any time, any place you need to lift something heavy, you're going to find one of these. Uh, so we started doing a survey, and what we wanted to see was where they were used, where they're manufactured. So we, we already nailed down that they're used everywhere, where they're manufactured. So we selected some vendors to look at in regions that were uh, a global mapping to make sure that we didn't just pick one area, one specific uh, item, or and we wanted to make sure that this was a pro. If we're going to find anything, the findings are going to be a global issue. <laughs> 
So as you can see, we have uh, lots of countries and regions from around the world covered here. So how do they work? The transmitter communicates over RF to the receiver, which we're going to go ahead and start it up here. And what we're going to do is uh, turn the crane on, yeah. please. So what we're going to do is it lifts. Okay. <laughs> What happened there was it opened a relay, it drove the motor, lifted the beer ice hat coin. Uh, the, the receiver then controls something in a factory, in, a in any one of those locations we mentioned earlier. Okay, So now we know how they work. But what are the risks? And that's what we really wanted to determine here was what was the risks of this? How does this work? Can we reverse engineer this and, and does everything work out fine? Or is it insecure? Or was it secure? So the risk here is most of these item or devices that we found were in the 400 to 900 megahertz range, uh, which means in by specs and by design, they wanted to, them to work within usually 300 meters of the receiver. Um, but as we all know from doing security research, uh, the limit there is by power not by dis and so an attacker can be kilometers away depending on the frequency and ideal scenarios moisture levels and whatnot so what we wanted to do was place a scenario where we are an attacker so as we mentioned earlier the operator is controlling the factory what happens then is the attacker records the command so this is one of the first tests we did, which was, can we do a replay attack? And so we wanted to see if we were able to just record and replay commands. So we captured the data, and then the attacker would transmit and record the data, and then would be able to control the factory without the operator's, permis operator's permission. So we set out to start doing that, and what happened was a little interesting. Um, and Jonathan's going to talk a little bit here about our methodology and the way we actually tried to achieve this. So, um, Jonathan. So, as you guys might know, if you've ever tried to do it for yourselves, you know, reversing RF can be challenging, right? Especially, you know, if you're talking about different devices and, and kind of a range of targets. And for us, we had chosen several vendors and several different devices that we wanted to uh, kind of attack, right? So, you know, obviously you can get an SDR, you can record the signal, but then what do you do, right? Um, and typically you're trying to first start out by determining basic signal characteristics. Maybe you want to know the frequency, which is uh, used. Maybe you want to know the modulation or encoding or even something about the higher level protocols that are being used in order to determine what security risks there are. <coughs> and this can be difficult, as mentioned, um, especially to be precise. Um, you know, my SDR that I purchased, of course, they manufacture it the best way they can, but it's not necessarily a piece of test equipment. And crystals and frequencies and things can drift, right? And if you're trying to determine specifically um, characteristics about your signal, this can be challenging. And again, it can be tedious to do if you have lots of uh, devices and states that you want to examine. And in our case, we had a global team. So <coughs> we had a certain number of devices, a certain number of people. So this is also a, you know, kind of a logistical challenge in, in terms of reversing. And again, you might end up looking at waterfall plots and graphs. And if this is data that you've never seen before, you might be wondering, did I record this properly? Is this noise? Um, you have no real kind of standard to verify your work against because you've never seen it before. So let's talk about another way this can be done. You know, you can start by examining the embedded system that you're looking at kind of from a high level, right? You might be able to determine that there's a microcontroller and a radio and some basic components that kind of work together, 
and in these kinds of devices, and in fact, in a lot of sub-gigahertz uh, radio devices, in fact, potentially even the device I'm holding, um, there's a typical set of radio ICs that are used. Um, there's not a lot of them, um, and they typically are all controlled via SPI. So what that implies is, again, if you look at your system design, you have some firmware and a microcontroller, and those are running together, and you have a radio sitting over here, and you can understand that everything the radio does transits via SPI. So it's a great place to instrument. And of course, in conjunction with the data sheet of the radio IC, um, you can kind of learn, learn what all your possible signal parameters might be. And you can also, over SPI, look at some of the more complex protocol interactions, right? So instead of recording RF, let's try to attach a logic analyzer to SPI and log those signals. And this is kind of an example of what you might see in a data sheet. You can see several configuration registers there and how they're mapped. And the data sheet will give you very specific information about what the radio will do when you configure, configure it. So <coughs> we attach the logic analyzer. And then you end up with a bunch of waveforms, which you know, if you want to sit there and look at every single wave and understand how SPI works, um, you'll get there. But it can be very, very challenging. So we, we went there, and we created a tool to log SPI and kind of convert it to basic read and write SPI operations. But again, with many different radio states and lots of SPI commands being sent and received, this is a lot of data to look at, especially if you, you know, press a button or turn the device on, and you end up with thousands and thousands of SPI operations. And also, you might want to examine many states, like what happens when the device boots? Does it authenticate? Um, is there some kind of key exchange? Or what happens? What does the device do when it's idle? <clears throat> what happens when I press a button or release a button? Um, you can see how the data kind of can explode in this case. So here is kind of an example of a few different log formats that we started out with. You know, some have basic binary decoding and then also some hex uh, here. But <coughs> in the end, you're going to be looking at the data sheet, looking at these logs, and kind of try to work through how all this works. And it's still not where we need to be to be efficient. So let's go from spy operations to data sheet registers, right? You know, we can literally look at the data sheet, copy and paste all the register references into Python, right? <clears throat> and then we can start work towards uh, making a decoder, right? So at least now we can see a particular configuration register is being accessed, which is a lot better than looking at waveforms, right? But again, we still might have hundreds of register operations. And so this is what it looks like at this layer. You can see at the top, um, you know, they're reading the RSSI state or the signal strength. They're reading some radio state, waiting it for it to become idle, and then they're uh, issuing a receive command. And this is, you know, kind of a little bit more intuitive if you're familiar with the data sheet than just looking at hex or binary, right? But again, <coughs> if you have lots of commands, it's on you to look at the order of each command, kind of understand how the radio works, how a radio, uh, this particular radio transmits and receives. But we can still do it better. Imagine if we persist the state of the radio, emulate the internal registers, and just kind of keep track of it for you. And you might ask, well, how do we know the initial values of these particular registers? And of course, they're documented in the data sheet. And we further um, instrumented our tool to allow us to dump the current state of all the emulated registers at any point in our logs. And clearly, you might want to know <coughs> what is the exact configuration of the radio at the transmit point or at the reception point. And this is kind of ties back to the original question. How do we know the very specifics of the radio signal? Well, if I have logs and I emulate the state and I stop, I can then go and examine the state and answer any question I want to know about the radio. And so this is kind of what our emulated radio looks like, right? 
You can see that certain registers were read and, uh, read and written to, their current values, as well as um, the number of times they, the registers were accessed, and even here, whether um, defaults were used, meaning did the software rely on the default from the data sheet, or did the software program the value of the register? And default values of registers can change between part versions and um, generations of parts, so it's an important thing to know. And then in the bottom section, <coughs> we can see various commands that were also executed. So that gives us kind of an initial view of, or an instantaneous view of the radio, right? But it's more complicated than that, right? Because the radio might have back and forth communications. So you might want to be able to answer questions about what's happening at the protocol layer. So we also created some GNU radio flow graphs, which would transmit and receive packets. And then we attached it to our emulator via zero message queue and some GNU radio polymorphic types. Just a message passing kind of interface. So ultimately, this allows us to record spy traffic, replay it all the way from the logic analyzer level out to RF over the air. And once we have this complete framework, you know, we can easily compare between the actual physical device and what our emulation says. So we can determine if we're kind of on the right track in our reversing process. And these are um, on the top the transmit section of our GNU radio flow graph, and on the bottom, the receive side. And you can see we have the zero message queue blocks going into our custom GNU radio protocol parser. And this is just kind of an example of the message passing interface. You can see that we're just creating a GNU radio polymorphic type, as well as you know setting some dictionary values which determine the uh, exact packet that we want to transmit. But as you learn how the protocol works, you've got to also find the vulnerabilities. And luckily with this emulator setup, <coughs> you can instrument or provide debugging information at almost any layer um, in the radio. And you can replay uh, logic analyzer captures and use your emulated system to interact with an actual physical device, which is a huge benefit. And in my case, up until today, I never touched these physical devices, right? I had some RF captures, I had some spy logs, and I was able to generate um, this radio um, kind of system by, you know, kind of piecewise implementing it and then allowing my colleagues to do some simple tests. And this is an example of how the emulator works. You just kind of instantiate it, tell it to reset all its uh, state to default, and then play some logs through it. And then you can configure whether it will break on transmit or at any particular point. And you know, through this process, at, you know, as Stephen mentioned, we found several different kinds of attacks. And in this case, the vendors that we tested for replay, unfortunately, all of them were susceptible. We found uh, command injection and e-stop abuse. And if you don't know what e-stop is, of course, it's kind of the emergency stop button, the big red button. And here you can have denial of service by you know, repeatedly sending e-stop. And of course, command injection, you can forge your own commands. And replay, you can cause chaos just by replaying the activities that they're engaging in. And then mal malicious repairing may not be obvious, but you know, there's a way to associate a device uh, transmitter to a receiver. So you can actually interfere with that and cause a repairing to occur um, where it repairs to the receiver repairs to an unknown transmitter or to your transmitter also can cause denial of service. So that's good and well what we discussed there was so we had physical access. So I wanted to test something here, which was without physical access, could we obtain some information uh, so that we could remotely attack a company? Um, so things are blurred here um, to protect the in uh, innocent here. Um, but this is a training video I found online uh, from a 
steel manufacturer that's in my area. And this training video was on YouTube, as you can tell. And what happened here was there, it was the training video for safety for the crane operators to how to safely move material around. Um, but what I saw when I was watching the video was a very interesting screenshot as I grabbed here, which we've blurred it, but that's the manufacturer strap, so it actually has the crane manufacturer's name on it. And so based off of that, I read the documents on it, and they use dip switches to uh, determine which uh, frequency that they'll be communicating at. So I knew where this place was, so I sat outside of it in a public park with some SDR equipment. And what I was able to find was the crane. And if you look at that, I think that's like channel 32 or something like that, or it was around there. Um, so as I started moving through, I found the communications, we were able to record it, and I never replayed it because they were an unwilling participant, but we did, in some of the cases overseas, with permission, we're able to control real cranes, not just toy cranes, um, with permission of the owners. Um, so we were able to uh, re do, replay this attack and many, many times over and over where we were able to, after all the hard work that Jonathan had done, and I would also like to point out, I never had one of these cranes either, or one of the controllers. We had them overseas because uh, this project had uh, seven people on it, and so they were overseas, so we had to come up with a way to start doing things very distributed, and it worked out really well, as you can tell. Um, Jonathan was able to emulate a whole um, system to where we could communicate uh, with the cranes. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to run a really quick demo. As you can tell, my transmitter is here. And from everything that he learned, um, we're going to move the crane with no one touching the transmitter. So here I kind of have a Blade RF. And really to demonstrate the ease of this attack, all we did was hold down the official transmitter button, record. And now we're just going to replay a set of those commands, which we pre-recorded. Yep. There were some vendors. We tested up to 14 vendors. Um, Trend Micro owns uh, ZDI, so everything was reported and has been fixed where it can be fixed. And not all vendors were susceptible to replay attack, but it is a particularly kind of weak vulnerability. Yes, some of them we had to do a little extra work uh, and decode some messages and stuff like that. So this one was one of the easier ones, so that's why it's the demo, just so we didn't have to sacrifice anything to the demo gods. <laughs> um, and so as you could see, we moved left or east and west and then up and down. Uh, with, with this crane. Um, so if we go back to the slides real quick. I was, I live in Tennessee, and Travis Goodspeed lives in Tennessee, and he's, you know, I know him pretty well. And so I watched a presentation last year at B-Sides Knoxville that it was a replay of what he gave at Schmucon uh, last January. And so there's this thing called the Good Watch that he made. It made it to be a wearable uh, that he liked, that he would use. And I was thinking to myself, I bet I could get, I wonder if I could control a crane with this watch. And so I actually built one. And yeah, I can. So from a watch, so what we've done is we've miniaturized from taking a Blade RF to a watch, which is good. Um, battery life is horrible. If I do this for five minutes, the, batteries are, the battery is dead um, because it takes a lot of power. It's a three volt bat battery, but I can transmit in proximity, a pretty good proximity with a watch, but that's still a local attack. So what we also wanted to do was, could we do this while we're further away? <laughs> 
And so what we were able to do was one of my coworkers uh, on this project, Federico, um, miniaturized some hardware, bought some custom chipsets. And what this is, it's a remote attacker over a 4G LTE with a planted device with a ba battery. Um, it communicates to this on, on a command. It has a command line interface. And remotely, we can do the exact same thing. Overall, the equipment that we used, um, so we have a Blade RFs, uh, roughly $480. Um, a Hack RF1 is uh, $300, and we use one of those as well. Uh, the Yardstick one, uh, we use that for a little bit. Uh, it has limitations on some of the radios that we were using. Uh, there was more 4FSK, um, so we actually had to patch uh, RFCAT to do it a little bit better. Uh, it still didn't work out. We used the Panda, Pandua RF. A little, it's a remote. A little bit. It's the same. It's using RF Cat, same chipset. It's from a guy in France. Um, and then our special custom, we spent forty dollars to build it. Uh, this watch is roughly around a hundred dollars because you have to buy the watch off of Amazon because Casio doesn't really make them. And then the parts, hardware, time. Um, but we can miniaturize it down to to a watch. So that's where we're at. Uh, we had 14 vendors tested, uh, released their CVEs on many of them, lots of patches. Um, so if you have a crane operator, or if you, own, or if you are a crane operator and have these devices, talk to your vendors and let, get them patched if they are. Ask them if they're susceptible to this, if it's one of the vendors we may not have tested. Uh, which will be available, it's already available, and in, in our paper came out today. Um, on my last slide here, we have links to it. You can get to the blog, to the paper. From there, uh, the researchers on this project were uh, Akira Urano, uh, Jonathan uh, Marco Balduzzi, Stephen Hilt, myself, uh, Philip Lynn, uh, Federico Maggi, and Rain Reiner Vossler. Uh, that's who did all this, and you can tell by the names, we're globally dispersed, so that's why we had to kind of uh, figure out ways to remotely get to the hardware. So at this point in time, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jacob Kitchell, Accenture Security. This is the QA portion. Uh, does anybody have any questions? If you could just introduce yourself. Yeah, sure, Marty Edwards. Um, so beyond the basic replay hacks, did you see any of the vendors doing any attempt at you know, cryptographic uh, exchanges, key exchanges, or is this pretty much all clear text, or would you prefer not to say? So th there were some that were not clear text, but they were encoded. Um, but one of the issues with one of the vendors was it was uh, XORed with the pairing ID. Um, so uh, what we did in that case was we set our pairing ID to zero and then figured out that, oh, that's what they're using. So then we built a library of every possibility of all pairing IDs and made a dictionary that all we have to do is run it against that. We pop out the pairing ID, we can reverse it. So, yeah. you know, basically another perfect example of roll your own crypto gone wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, so in a lot of cases, um, the, from what I understand, when people do XORing, it's more about uh, FCC uh, licensing. Um, so they're not sending too much power. So they're shifting it all over the place. So they're not just sending all zeros or all ones. So that's one of the original reasons. But it, it is crypto gone wrong, but it may not have been designed with security in mind. Yeah, unfortunately, we didn't find any proper authentication or encryption. Um, but as he mentioned, there was one vendor, and this particular XORing scheme, the protocol did look very difficult initially, right? So it might have the effect of discouraging a reverser um, because it did kind of appear like encryption, right? But once we kind of dug into it, um, we, were, we were able to reverse it. So. Any other questions?
Hi, Rick Cherney. Uh, did they do anything with frequency hopping, or was it just a straight up uh, single frequency? None of the ones we looked at had frequency hopping. Uh, there was one vendor who came back to us and they didn't patch because their product was into life. Uh, we asked them if they had any other, had changed any of their communications since that one product we tested. Um, I don't think we ever got a response, so. Yeah, and as mentioned, you mentioned the dip switches earlier. Many products are either set by dip switches, or in, in the case of this one here, there's just kind of a channel number printed on the bottom, and this one will only ever work on that channel. Yeah, and if you need to change the frequency, you have to pry the crystal. Yeah, there was one user manual which suggests how to unsolder and replace a crystal. This is fairly un <laughs> unsophisticated, unfortunately. Jalal from Applied Risk. Um, have you guys looked at the embedded parts, especially the firmware, if there has been any vulnerabilities across those 14 devices? So do we look at any other than the 14 devices? Is that the question? Or do we think it continues on past the 14 devices? Yeah, we have a little trouble hearing you. But. Yeah. Sorry, just to clarify. So I was referring to the embedded part, the firmware part of those devices. Mm -hmm. So have you been able to look into the transmitters itself yep. on the hardware we, part? We did a little firmware reversing. You, yes. You might be able to speak to it more than um, So we did a little bit, once again, when we, we really wanted to come after the radio communications, because many of these devices are still not Ethernet um, capable. So we didn't really look too hard into the firmware. Uh, we were out of the firmware. We were looking for more things like uh, or were they, you know, ones that were a little harder to figure out? Were they doing hamming? What was kind of the modulations? Those were in the firmware when it's not necessarily set to the chip. How is that being handled? How do they decode it? Like we looked at that one vendor with the XORing trying to get the firmware off of that device, and they had done some firmware protection, so we couldn't really uh, pull it off the device. But we did not see things like encrypted firmware packages, secure boot, advanced, uh, you know, or cryptography being used in the firmware update process. Um, you know, lots of these embedded systems have kind of small microcontrollers. So at typically at most you see is the, you know, the fuse bit burned in the micro that says I'm not allowed to read the firmware out or something of that nature. But, you know, those systems can also be circumvented. Any other questions? Okay, I got one for you. Um, once you pulled up on site for the case study, just walk us through what's the time to showing up to the time you're able to isolate the frequency and just try a replay. So because I hadn't found the YouTube video prior, um, I already had done my homework, knew which the dip, set, sw dip switch settings were. Um, so I sat down, I knew the frequency to tune to, uh, all I had to do was look for communication, so I actually, it was a hot summer day, so I actually they had all their doors open so I could actually see in and see when they were moving it. I looked and said, there it is, and that's the channel that they were using. Yeah, and the device that we created, the radio relay kind of device, um, if an attacker were to kind of leave that device nearby, um, you'd kind of only be limited by the you know, battery life of that device, and you could remotely kind of monitor um, for transmissions or else replay, right? So you mentioned at the beginning of the talk that this was kind of a, an RF research project, part mm -hmm. of a series almost. Yep. Uh, what's next? Have you started to think about where to go after cranes? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we can talk later because we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Will you be attacking Adam Crane? <laughs> <laughs> he says no. Maybe. We'll talk later. <laughs> yeah, what's his protocol like? I don't know. <laughs> Only if it's over DNP3. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Let's give him a round. Um,